As the American people suffer through the worst economic crisis in 80 years, there's one place they can turn to for clear, reliable analysis and a plan for restoring shared prosperity. In fact, the Economic Policy Institute has been that place for a quarter century. Well, I want to say thank you to EPI for 25 years of being the authoritative voice on economic issues and really the voice of working American families. They are an indispensable partner for us policymakers who need good ideas to help the American people. When our office needs some help and documentation on issues like why infrastructure building would be good for the economy or why China manipulating its currency costs millions of American jobs, EPI is the first place we turn to. So many issues that are so important to today's economic debate, whether it's wage stagnation, income inequality, the quality of jobs. Every one of those issues is now deeply ensconced in the mainstream debate. And while people may not recognize it, in every case, EPI brought them into the mainstream. I believe that thanks to EPI, the conversation around these economic issues has really changed. You should pass this jobs plan right away. EPI is a kind of crucial dissenting voice when Washington decides to sort of rise in a chorus behind destructive economic policies, and they do that very often. At EPI, you've got some of the best analysts, economists, who understand that the heart of the economy is not finance, it is not movements of capital, it is people. It is people who work, it is people who spend, it is people who are struggling every single day. Most people spend most of their time working. It's really what people care about, but it's so interesting that so few of the think tanks focus on jobs. And that's what EPI's role has been. We have an economy, uh, the political discourse, in which a lot of the important things are really what's happening to workers, what's happening to workers at different levels of income, what's happening to the distribution, um, and uh, EPI is focused on those things in a way that really nobody else is. EPI's core concern with America's workers touches on so many important issues, from health care to education to immigration and budget policy. It's easy to see why they've become an indispensable piece of the progressive movement. I think EPI really understands that in order to be useful, they've got to get their work into the hands of organizers and activists who are out there day in, day out, trying to make change. And when I call EPI, I feel like they back me up and help me understand what's going on in the national economy, what do workers have the right to demand from their state economy, and they sort of strengthen my resolve and help me say it with a lot more authority. Fine, good job. I don't feel like I can do my job without EPI. EPI's sterling reputation comes first and foremost from producing credible data analysis time and time again. Over the last 25 years, I have read literally hundreds and hundreds of EPI reports and policy papers and recommendations. I, I know that, that I can trust every number in an EPI paper. And uh, for a working journalist, and especially for someone who uh, deals with deadlines, um, it's, it's just uh, unbelievably important. Testimony. Every day, EPI's economists go toe-to-toe -to -toe with far better funded adversaries on the right. It's a fight of David and Goliath with very conservative and ideological think tanks. What EPI has done is to arm progressives with the kind of data and research that allows us to debunk the myths. One of the things that the right has been remarkably successful about is um, what Ross Perot used to call gorilla dust. You know, he'd say when gorillas are fighting, they pick up a handful of dust and they throw it in their opponent's face because then it blinds them temporarily. And I think the right does that. I think they use pseudoscience, they use renta scientists and rent an economist to try to distract and divert us. And what EPI does is come right back. They're, they're like the visine, they're the eyewash. Going back to 2008 levels makes absolutely no sense. EPI's clarity and insight have made it a media powerhouse. I think that they've understood the importance of how do we message this? How do we communicate this? How do we take this data and translate it uh, so that the person on the street can understand it but within a larger context? 
For the last 16 years running, EPI has received more media citations than any other progressive think tank in America. In 2010 alone, EPI was cited over 20,000 times in elite national and regional media. And now, through its blog and social media, EPI reshapes policy debates and starts new ones. EPI began in 1986 when Jeff Foe brought together leading economists who understood the threat posed by Ronald Reagan's agenda. It seemed to a number of us that Reagan was different than the previous Republicans because he represented a powerful effort to change the way people thought about the economy. Return economics to its classical roots. One of the biggest lies in history is trickle-down economics. Uh, when we founded the Economic Policy Institute, we needed to counteract that big lie. And they did it by crunching the numbers. They liked data. They were uh, uh, data mavens, if you will. Just about the first day I got there, this big box arrived, and inside was what we ended up calling Sparky. Uh, this was a big, fat computer system, which, by the way, ran what was called mag tapes, these big tapes, uh, not CDs. Sparky gave us the capacity not just to take the aggregate statistics as they came out and were published every month, but to really delve down into the cross tabs and to be able to slice and dice the numbers so that we could really find out a lot of information, whether it was by decile or by demographic or by gender, that really allowed EPI to draw conclusions about who was getting hurt and who was getting helped uh, as the economy changed. In 1988, EPI introduced its flagship publication, The State of Working America, now in its 12th edition and with a website all its own. The State of Working America has been a critical resource for me, really the go-to with answers about the economy as it affects low-wage working families. You know, if ever there was an economic Bible for progressives and activists and organizers, it's The State of Working America. For a generation of progressive economic policymakers, we look forward to the newest edition of the State of Working America in the same way today young people look forward to the newest edition of the iPhone. EPI's charts and figures have sparked countless epiphanies for people working to fix an economy that's failed working people. Eight or nine years ago, I started seeing this chart coming out of the Economic Policy Institute that said that during the post-war period, productivity sort of doubled and median family income sort of doubled right along with it. And then right around the time when I was a little kid, those two things split apart from each other and productivity kept on going upward, but median family income just continued on this sort of flat course. People now understand that working families' income should go up as, as the economy's productivity goes up, and that hasn't been happening for the past generation. And it's, it's like it's EPI's fact. EPI has also revealed where most of the fruits of workers' productivity have gone, to the richest of the rich. EPI understands that one of the major stories of our era is widening inequality. And no one does a better job of compiling and presenting the inequality data than EPI. I, uh, I walk around with a chart. I carry it everywhere. I have it in laminated form. I have it in blown up form. This is an EPI chart. And what I love about it is that you don't have to read any numbers to see all of the growth in income has gone to the wealthiest Americans. People look at this chart and they gasp and then a lot of pieces fall into place for them. No economy and no society can thrive and sustain itself with that degree of inequality. In fact, the last time America saw this level of inequality was the late 1920s, and we all know how that ended. During the jobs crisis of our own times, the market for timely, accurate analysis has boomed. The EPI became more important than ever if you wanted to know what was happening, not just to working people, but what was happening to poor people. I mean, the fact that blacks and Latinos were hurt much worse by unemployment than some other groups in the society. Well, we know largely because of, you know, I know because of EPI, uh, that, that workers' prospects are permanently damaged. By, by long periods of unemployment. That every month we let the, the depressed economy drift on without resolution is, is basically sacrificing the future. And the way we talk about this in public discourse is completely upside down. While the DC crowd has been focused on budget deficits, 
EPI has been focused on the same thing as American families, the job crisis, the lost wages, incomes, and opportunities. The fact is, we don't need to face this high persistent unemployment. Better policy can get us out of this. I want to thank you for the opportunity to explain why the U.S. economy needs a large economic stimulus to boost demand for goods and services and to prevent a serious and protracted loss of jobs. EPI was the first and loudest voice to say, look, jobs are disappearing, wages are declining. We need a huge stimulus. We need a stimulus that is even larger than the stimulus being contemplated. EPI, once again, was saying what needed to be said and saying it in a way that needed to be said. In December of 2009, EPI unveiled the American Jobs Plan. Ideas like supporting state and local governments, ideas like direct investment in America's infrastructure, and creation of public jobs. This is exactly what this moment calls for. So I was enormously pleased and gratified to see President Obama at what was perhaps his finest hour in, in many, many months talk about those ideas that I had first seen in EPI's American Jobs Plan. The American Jobs Act answers the urgent need to create jobs right away. EPI was prescient. They saw the future and they were ahead of the curve. In Washington's budget battles, EPI fights for America's working people. When the co-chairs of the President's Deficit Commission proposed slashing the social safety net and dramatically scaling back public investments, Commissioner Jan Schakowsky dissented. With EPI's help, I was actually able to introduce an alternative proposal, one that achieved the same deficit-cutting goals, but also did it without hurting ordinary people, middle-class people, particularly uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Since its founding, EPI has been deeply engaged with the issue of trade, and it's changed both minds and policies. What EPI did was bring the worker into the debate about trade. And that has been influential, and in fact, it has been successful, because today, all of our trade agreements do include labor and environmental standards in the core text. The passage of the China Currency Bill was the biggest bipartisan jobs bill that that we've passed in a long, long time. The EPI played a role in that because of their jobs numbers. I use them almost incessantly, and Republicans use them. The Economic Policy Institute, the Economic Policy Institute, the Economic Policy Institute's report. EPI has become the, uh, the center for talking seriously about what is a serious part of our problem. EPI has also taken the battle for working people to the states by helping to create and grow EARN, the Economic Analysis and Research Network, 57 think and do tanks in 43 states. EARN proved its worth in the 2000s when efforts to raise the minimum wage stalled in Congress but caught fire in states across the country. It was really great to suddenly have EPI and the rest of the EARN network behind us helping us to figure out a strategy for what kinds of pieces of research would help strengthen this fight and help us understand what role does minimum wage really play in the economy. And of course it was even better when we won the fight and we felt like this solid research had played a role in that. In the end, 34 states raised their minimum wage, and that spurred Congress in 2007 to raise the federal minimum wage as well. In 2011, Republican governors and legislatures launched a broad attack on the middle class, and EARN groups worked with EPI to fight back with timely, high-quality research on all of the key issues on collective bargaining, on right to work, on state budgets. And this really allowed our folks to make the arguments they need, to have the facts at their fingertips to counter the spurious right-wing attacks that were funded by corporate think tanks across the country. With a series of state-by-state -state reports, EPI and EARN debunk the central right-wing myth that public employees are overcompensated. If you consider their education levels, if you consider uh, the kind of work they're doing, no, they are not overpaid. In fact, they're undercompensated. And that kind of data really helped set the tone and helped embolden a resistance. EPI's long-standing interest in increasing social mobility and growth naturally drew it into the debate over education, where it's become a source for holistic solutions to provide a great education for every child. In 2008, EPI launched a new campaign, the Broader, Bolder Approach to Education, 
with a statement signed by 60 visionary leaders in the field. BBA is saying if you want to eliminate disparities, if you want to reduce the achievement gap, you've really got to level the playing field by addressing the ways in which children's needs are not met because of poverty and inequality in America. A major convert to the broader, bolder approach is Diane Ravitch. I think that as I look over the past couple of decades, EPI has been consistently right. And as I have begun to see the world differently, I realize that EPI is the, probably the best source of information and evidence for strategies that we need to actually heal our schools and heal our society. Over the past quarter century, EPI has established itself as a force in Washington, D.C. and across the nation. A force for fairness, a force for clarity, a force working for people who work for a living. I couldn't be more proud of EPI and what we've accomplished and the influence we've had. But we have great challenges in front of us. People are being told they can't have what they need. In fact, the economy can produce a good quality job for everyone, decent health care, a secure retirement, and a wonderful education for every child. At EPI, we come to work every day to make that happen.